And I got thanks for doing this, Brian. I got I got a, a ton of questions. So I. I no, I love to came with if I, if I wear you out, I apologize. Number one, it's hard to do usually. You were one of my favorite players when I scouted you when you were playing, because you got the absolute most out of your ability. I mean, there was never a day when Brian Hartline that I saw when Brian Hartline didn't give a hundred percent and got everything there was to give. So, how did you make the transition, both principally psychologically, from that kind of a player? to a coach when you're going to be coaching guys who maybe don't have the same approach that you took as a player. Yeah. Well, I appreciate you saying that. First of all, it means a lot. And I would say, you know, secondly, I think a lot of those guys I'm talking about myself, I don't think we really cognitively make that, make that assessment. It's kind of like, we're kind of built that way. And we over time uh, become that. I think it's more about who we are than than maybe what we do. So uh, to operate that way as a player, I think it just naturally and organically became that way as a coach. Now, uh, it, it comes across in a different way. It's not being able to just run fast and strain and do all those kind of things. It's more about, you know, your hour to hour, minute to minute. Uh, I think it's probably more of a lifestyle. So I think making that transition uh, was pretty organic. I think, first of all, I loved playing. And uh, the pure the pureness of that just – organically kind of grabs you to, to, to play that way and to be that way. Well, I changed my gear. I, I fell in love with coaching. So when I fell in love with something, I kind of don't really know how to do it, you know, a, a half tempo. So uh, they kind of get all of me. And I think that over time, uh, those guys, again, drops in the bucket. They kind of continually hear me and feel me. And, and I think it just kind of, you know, kind of takes care of itself, you uh, you know, I really do love it, man. It's, it's, uh, I never anticipated being a coach. I never planned on being a coach. I, I fell, uh, you know, in, in love with the uh, the room itself, the people in the room, uh, and then it kind of just naturally happened. And I think that, uh, but what you're hitting on is something special. You know, there's a, a big part of me that, you know, listen, these guys can do things that I could never do. Now, if I could, you know, teach them how to do the things I could do, and you can kind of put that maybe that guy with a limited skill set in a in a and, and a guy that has unlimited skill set, you know, what's the possibilities? And I think that, you know, those guys understanding that the details at which I used to play with are really why guys not only are good players, but last for a long time in the league. And as you know, you know, the, the difference between a, a, a good player and a great player. And to me, it's just the ability to do it for a long time. Why don't guys do it for a long time? And uh, we try to adjust, we try to, you know, um, talk about that, address that, and realize that it's not about how high and how fast and how well you jump. You know, it's about the cerebral approach to the game. And, uh, you know, we spent a lot of time on that, Bill, honestly. I mean, that's that's the biggest thing that we hang our hat on in this room. Uh, you know, it's really hard to get a player off the field that just consistently make, does the right thing. And we focus on that. It's not about how fast you are and how big you are and how high you jump. A lot of guys are all kinds of different measurables but I've never met a, a great player that, for lack of a better t- term, was, you know, dumb, you know, and, and it can't cognitively understand what's going on. All the great ones do it. And when I say great, the guys that play, you know, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12 years in the NFL, uh, th- those to me are the great players. Well, that leads into the, the, the obvious next question. As you put together your recruiting list and, and, and you know, begin to look at recruits around the country, What's the profile of the wide receiver that, that, that you're looking at? And, and take us through the, the three phases, physical, mental, emotional. Yeah, I think, uh, you know, that, that's an imperfect science. And as you know, I mean, I think there's so many variables at play. Uh, not a whole lot different probably when going through the draft, uh, you know, the draft uh, process. So, um, you know, at Ohio State, we have the ability to recruit anybody in the country. And although that's uh, a large pool of athletes, uh, sometimes makes that more challenging because you have to really make sure you are able to dive into the individual. Uh, again, I think you kind of can get a feel for that. It's there's a lot of guys that can run fast, jump high, you know, catch the football. You know, a lot of those in my mind, Bill, are are check the box kind of attributes. I mean, if you're are you able to do this, this, and this? Uh, I think the way at which the mind works and how they talk about it and what they're exposed to uh, is really the the, the investment you got to make as a coach. I think that. Uh, really diving into the person uh, gives you the best odds of success. I mean, I, I, like you know, I mean, at the end of the day, nothing's perfect. It's just a 
uh, you know, a, a percentage or odds of success assessment. That's all it is. Like when he runs this fast, his odds of success are this. When he's this tall, when he has these kind of hands, you know, you continually add into that that mathematical equation, you're getting odds of success. You're not getting a guarantee. So, you know, I think with that is the mental approach uh, to the game as a person, uh, the ability to, you know, take information and then apply it, that self background of the coaches. I mean, really having people around those guys that you trust to ask those questions are, is paramount. Uh, but that, that profile, uh, yes, there's nothing worse I think at times than bringing a guy into let's say at least Ohio State that uh, you know maybe is highly recruited, uh, you know it's getting told by everybody how great he is, uh, but he's really not where he needs to be. So you know although the the recruiting services do a great job of kind of exposing you to the amount of athletes out there, it's really our job to make sure we we don't find the best ones, we find the right ones because like anyone, I in my opinion the right ones become the best ones, you know? And I think that, again, I use that analogy loosely because it's very, you know, objective. It's not as subjective as people want it to be. And, and I think that, you know, we try to do the best we can with that, but the personal profile is so, so important just as much as the athletic profile. What, the, what do you prioritize as a, as a skill set? If you, if you could have, let's say, one player with with uh, uh, only three skills. Which which would which three would they would they be? Well, okay, I'll go obviously with the receiver play. I would say that uh, number one is still you know catch the football. You got to be able to do that. So, so when that ball goes in the air, you know obviously that that's the game's named after that thing in the air. So we're going to protect that football. And uh, uh, that would be number one, catching the ball. And I think, you know, again, with that, I'm going to say, you know, it's it's not where you are, it's where you're able to be. So, like, if, if I see you, you know, tracking the ball okay and everything, you're not out of the woodwork uh, of, of mechanically on how you operate, like, I can teach you to be better. That's okay. Uh, I would say that uh, the next one would be, uh, you know, you got to have the ability to run, you know, and I think – you know, and again, it's not like you have to be a, you know, a sub four four guy. That's not real in high school. But I mean, you have to be able to cognitively know the importance. And I would say, when I say run, I mean like maximize, you know, your skill set. So if you're like a, let's just say a high school kid. If you're a four six zero, but you play at a four six zero, that's good. That's a good sign because as you continue to mature and you get stronger, you get faster. All those things, you'll be able to apply that to the game. I think that seeing guys maximize what they're currently able to is a big uh, assessment. Not, you know, again, not where he's at currently, but where, where what's he capable of. I think that's really, really important. And I would say, man, really, like, it's it's a skill, but it's hard to assess. But it's really like that 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 athletic mindset. Like, you know, getting around those guys and realizing, like, how much can they really understand football-wise and what are they capable of? Because to me, Bill, like, mindset you know dictates action so like to me if i can approach your mindset and really attack that and really ask you to learn this and then apply this i mean you have a chance to really grow there's nothing more frustrating than a very talented player that can't cognitively process and then apply and if you have that problem you're always hitting a wall there's a wall there you cannot get past because at the end of the day this is not basketball this is a team sport so you can win a lot of football games with you know non-superstar players you want really good football players to become a really good football team and i think you know if you can kind of marry these all together that's when you become you know a great player because you fit into a great system and then you know go in the when the ball's in the air you catch it you're creating enough separation because you can run well enough and then you're also leveraging and, and, and running out of breaks and setting rights up because your cognitive understanding of the game you're able to apply that with your skill set. So I think the three of those, not, and again, you know that list is long, but those are probably the first three, you know, balls in the air, got to bring it in, got to be consistently catching the football, you know, and then you're able to run well enough and move well enough to then apply the things you want to do through your stems to create separation for the quarterback to throw and catch with you. I think that's really important. And I think that, you know, even in the run game, if you can understand coverage and where the run support player is and all that, you're able to get in the way at least to provide, you know, the ability to, to be an effective uh, run blocker as well.
Let's talk about two guys, the second being Marvin Harrison Jr., the first being Olave. Um, yeah. I loved Olave from the first time I saw him. And if he asked me to write a scouting report, I'd struggle because he doesn't, as, as some of the gurus said before the draft, he doesn't wow you. You know, there aren't, oh, man. That guy's phenomenal kind of plays, except all he does is make plays and he shows up in the end zone with the ball in his hands most of the time. Pretty good, pretty good plays. So, yeah. What what did he have that 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 made him great and now makes him a great pro? Of all the receivers you've turned out, he comes in as a rookie and he's setting the world on fire. Yep. Yeah, I think a lot of things we kind of hit on, honestly. I think his ball skills are off the charts. I mean, like I mean, the guy will high point the ball. It doesn't always have to because he's always running away from people. And when you got good quarterback play, you don't have to. But I, I know if you went and asked the Saints, you would watch them do that in practice. I guarantee it through camp. He was high pointing the football and going over top of people. And that's definitely in his, in his tool chest. He did it here at Ohio State. Just didn't have a lot of opportunities with that in games. But frankly, even against Penn State, there's some other ones you can find on film. It shows up. Uh, he can run. I mean, he can run now. He can run. And I think the biggest thing with him – that people don't really understand. The wildness is just the violence, right? The violence at which people put their foot in the ground, the explosion people talk about. But what they don't understand is if you watch him run routes, you don't know what he's doing. So, like, if you're a DB, the biggest the biggest art of running routes is the ability for a DB to pick up on tells on what you are doing before you do it. And Chris was, like, was excellent at it. He had great drive phase coming out of his stance. He had gave no indicators on what he was doing from a route perspective. So although he wasn't violent through top ends and violent on a release, he understood leverage. He knew how to clear an offhand jam. He knew how to get vertical. And that threat of running would scare the, sh the crap out of any DB. You know what I mean? So, you know, there, there, there's, there's definitely a standard of execution, but there's lots of ways to do that. And Chris didn't fit Garrett's mold. Garrett was a very violent outside the right. framework movement player, but Chris wasn't. And, and they both were very, uh, you know, very good at what they do in their own ways. And I think uh, being able to identify that is okay. But like I said, going back between the ball catching, uh, the ball skills, the ability to run, uh, and then you know, to me, the like the top end, the top end progression, like being able to go through a top end and understanding the urgency to come out of a top end, the way you come off the line of scrimmage, that strain out of breaks is where, you know, separation is created. So he understood that. Like, he was able to give no body language. He was able to enter a break before the DB knew it was coming, so advantage him, and he knew the urgency out of top ends. When you add those all together, you have a great route runner. And I think, you know, Chris is going to do that. I don't think that's ever going to fall off. And that's, you know, obviously paired with, frankly, outside of that box. His, his work ethic is second to none. So if you continue to add all those together – um, he's got a, a bright future ahead of him. So those, those, those things we kind of talked about really kind of apply to a lot of hopefully the guys you see coming out of our room. Ironically enough, uh, Marvin Sr. had that very same quality. You could never tell by his stem what, what was going to take place. It looked the same all the time. Yeah. He lined up on the right all the time. It never changed. And, mm -hmm. and DBs were at a loss to know when he was going to explode and what he was going to do. So speaking of that, Jr., what 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 this he certainly had got much more size and explosion apparently than his dad did but uh uh although i don't know about explosion dad was incredible yeah i don't yeah. know explosion uh tell us about him and 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 what the future holds well i would say that first and foremost uh again going through that process of recruiting like the cerebral approach to the game or, and, and just in general uh a1a and i think that you know, that unlocks everything you're capable of. If you don't have that, it is a, it is a struggle. And I think that, uh, not that he can't, you know, other guys can't get there, but he had that from day one. So that is a huge credit to his dad and his family on raising the kind of young man he is. Uh, that being said, you know, uh, how he's built, you know, I always thought it was interesting when I remember watching him in, in high school that, you know, he had the low end of his dad. Like he has a shorter like leg profile. I, didn't, I haven't measured his legs, but like when you look at him, He's got a, a you know a shorter um, you know legs, but he has like a long torso. So like his ability to transition through breaks and have all of the things that a shorter quote unquote receiver would have, he has. He possesses. Let alone you know his standard transition and trying to get through top ends in a three step transition and like holding himself accountable. I mean that's all great. 
but mechanically he has a lot of you know a lot of the things his dad has. He just is taller, so uh, he's able to rise up and go high point balls. Uh, he's really spent a lot of time on continuing to grow his ball skills, which is as you can see is off the charts now too. But he doesn't really take any particular skill for granted. I mean, he works like a pro. He's in here. I know Coach Day hit on it last you know last week. Like it would just become normal. He's in here with one of his teammates. He's going through the script. He knows his catch points on each. We have a great jugs machine and the Monarch machine that he's able to let him to get out there and operate it by himself if he wants to. So nothing goes, no rock that goes unturned with this guy. And, uh, you know, he's only, you know, 19, 20 year old young man. And uh, he operates the way you're supposed to operate as a pro. He takes care of his body. Uh, he's boring off the field, which is yeah, good, indeed. you know, and like, you know, he does, he does everything. Career he skill for to. Wide receiver. <laughs> I'm telling you, and like, and, and I, I can't, I can't give a better compliment than saying he is a dream to coach like that. That encompasses everything, you know, and, and we're able to sit down and talk stems and talk body language and, and Hey, Hey, think about what the DB's thinking here. I mean, he just digests it all. I mean, so much, Bill, you'll appreciate this. And I'm not gonna. I'm gonna let it go after today. But I had a note in my in my pregame test on a job responsibility during the game, and it was an earlier note in the week, and I didn't change it. And I sent it to get you know put into our you know notes uh, for review, and I missed it. He didn't. He he read it verbatim. He applied what I told him to apply, and I was wrong. That was an old note that we fixed through the week that did not help the play. And he did it the way I told him early in the week, not middle of the week, because my notes were wrong. And, you know, in turn, it was not a fully successful play. But he's like, the first thing I said, why'd you do that? He goes, coach, it was in our notes. You know, you handed it to us on Friday. I was like, got to be kidding me. But, like, I loved it. I mean, it's like he's not wrong. He, he, he never leaves one rock unturned. And everything he says um, that we say and talk about, he really takes the heart and tries to apply. So I really, really appreciate that. Your system spreads the field 53 and a third yards wide, which requires receivers to work in space and requires a lot of coordination with the quarterback. Two questions in, mm -hmm. in one, really. Um, the system, re what, what does the system require of the receivers? And how do you develop that other than just seven on seven with, with the sync with the quarterback? Yeah, I would say the quarterback does a great job communicating with the guys too. I mean, that that can't, we can't operate at the level which we operate without that happening. Uh, you know, coaches suggest, coaches draw lines, players make plays, and they make things work. You know, I would say that uh, a couple of things. One, uh, you have to be a smart player to play at Ohio State at receiver. I mean, the amount of things we we ask these guys to do, we literally probably put in a new playbook every week, which is very NFL like, and. Um, you know, we, we frankly shorten it. We don't shortcut a lot of things. Everything's very systematized, but like, you know, we are able to take things for granted on guys in the run game and not take it for granted. That means we don't appreciate it, but like we have them do a lot of different things similar to our tight ends, but that's everywhere. But I would say that, you know, um, formationally, the way we can get away with things on how this week do it this way and the way they're able to, you know, digest that and apply it is uh, pretty awesome. Uh, but you have to be smart. You got to study. You cannot just get by with, uh, you know, relying on all oh, get it by Saturday because by, by Saturday, the play is out. So we have to make sure we feel good about that. Uh, you know, I would say that, you know, as far as uh, the receivers go, you know, we like to really teach in this room, uh, you know, systematically, but also, you know, uh, you know, with generalities and making sure that we understand, okay, listen, like, Every route, and I'm going to use this not to get long-winded, but every route has a start point, a break point, and a catch point. And, and although our start point can change, a lot of times the top end point doesn't change and the catch point rarely changes, right? The spacing on the field is what it is. So we really spend a lot of time on being able to problem-solve routes. Like, it's a really good build to be able to, you know, draw up a play and act like it's going to happen this way. How rare is that? And it's pretty rare that it actually happens. So to have these guys play fast and understand their toolbox is filled and they're able to, you know, problem solve route concepts or, or routes individually through their top ends, uh, whether I'm working a throw by or whether I'm leveraging them or whether I'm burning time because the spacing allows me to, whatever that is, they really have bought into that. And they really understand, you know, conceptually what we're trying to get done, how important the spacing is, 
And then really, when is it one-on-one opportunities? And when is it, do I have to hit my landmarks and let the play take care of itself? And I really believe they bought into that. Uh, they show it every week. And when I kind of, you know, verbatim, you know, t- talk about those kind of things, they understand. They kind of put it in that toolbox and they put it in that, in that category. And they're like, okay, I'm good. You know, it's not a three by one backside isolation. It's like, hey, we got to be spaced out here because the concept will take care of itself. And uh, so conceptually, systematized, you know, as well, like all of those things, I think, play a part uh, playing receiver at Ohio State. But like I'm saying, like, you've got to be a guy that uh, one is a smart player and invest the time to make sure they understand conceptually what we got going on. How much time do you invest in the individual development? Let's let's take Marvin Jr. as an example, comes in with a ton of talent, um, great genetics, all of that stuff. Now he's a freshman and and has to get adjusted to a, a very sophisticated system, which he probably mm-hmm. hasn't had to deal with before at the high school level because he was better than anybody played. And if the coach was smart, he said, just go beat this guy and we'll score touchdowns. So yeah. uh, how do you get – what's the progr- the teaching progression from from – freshman year until the time you get him on the field. Yeah, I'd say that definitely takes time. I think this early enrollment definitely helps us, you know, having guys be in in January and get, you know, have a rough spring, which always happens for everybody of going through that. And then by the time they get to the summer, uh, if they put their time in the right way, I pick it up pretty quick. I would say we do a pretty good job of, uh, of getting, you know, once install one through install five, down pretty pat through the spring. We spent a lot of time in the summer on those. And then by the time you get to camp, you have a decent chance of it being your third time of seeing the same kind of install. When you get to the season, a lot of it's just kind of tweaks off of that, right? I mean, you still have, you know, 10 game plan specific, you know, route concepts or play concepts, but we've done a really good job of building that foundation both through the spring, the summer with elective time, and then also uh, in the fall. But what you're hitting on is, the time these guys spend together coaching each other up is critical. I mean, I think that the guys that are having great success now, you know, with, you know, Emeka and Marvin Harrison and Julian, these guys, uh, the peer pressure in our room is real. And I think not only from a good, but, you know, from a tough standpoint, but from a good standpoint, like it requires you to to do what these guys are doing. You're going to get left behind. So uh, they do a really good job doing it together. Uh, I would say that, you know, organically that, you know, you don't really know it unless you can teach it. I think a lot of my guys can teach it, especially to the young guys, and they kind of get asked to do so. So I think all of those things happen. It's not always by osmosis and being able to, like, be around it long enough. Sometimes that's part of it. But uh, it really comes down to the time that these guys believe in spending outside uh, time with me and with our coaching staff, but together. And I think, again, by fall, if you do come in in January as an early enrollee, by the time you get to fall camp, you're going through it your third time. And I think uh, we've done a pretty good job of outlining, you know, the first handful of installs of what we do for this year and then tweaking it throughout the season. Uh, this is my last one, and it, and it, and it's sort of a, an unfair question, but I'm going to ask it anyway. Um, if I had a bet, you're going to be a head coach more sooner than later. And so uh, if you're probably going to have to go to a school at a lower level of competition and a lower level of resources. So if I'm the AD at uh, uh, so-and-so state uh, in, you know, that's a division one, but doesn't have the resources of Ohio state and doesn't play in the big 10. Um, and, and therefore you can't get the quality of athlete that, that you're going to have at the, you know, that you have at Ohio state. Mm -hmm. Um, how would you approach that philosophically? What's your vision for that team? How are you going to create a winner in that situation? You know, I think, uh, I think it's, it's comparable to where we're at here. I mean, I think that obviously kind of, I, I, you know, outlined early, it comes down to, you know, who are, who are you working to beat? Right. I mean, who are you competing against truly? I mean, you always want to go to a school or be at a school and your focus is always when you're, your your conference first, you know, and I think that, you know, so that would be your first, you know, go at where are we at, you know, in our conference, where do they play? What do we play? How do we match up? And, uh, and who are we competing against every, every week, you know? And so that, you know, both offensively and defensively schematically, that's where you got to start. Um, and then, and once you go from there, then you got to get the players, uh, that you think would fit the system. I mean, that's important. Now, I will say uh, great coaches 
uh, don't have players fit a system, you know, great players have the system fits the players. Now that's, that's really critical. So you set out with a plan, but you got to know your plan has to adjust. Uh, that being said, like we're at Ohio state. So, you know, we have to win our conference. Uh, we need to, you know, prepare to be, be ready to play, you know, in the CFP. So who are we competing against? What kind of caliber of athlete are we competing against? And in the level at which we win, you know, in recruiting, we're competing against those same guys. So I think if you go to a quote unquote, you know, lower level, less resources university, uh, you're still, you still are competing against somebody and you have to make sure you're still competing against, you know, those guys every day, whether it be at practice, whether it be in recruiting um, and, uh, and just making sure that if you're handling that, you know, that's, that's number one, you know, and I think uh, uh, that would be the approach. I wouldn't say that the plans wouldn't change as things, you know, went, but uh, I think that, you know, the things that are tough at Ohio state are, are, are different toughnesses, maybe at a, at a lower level school, but they're still, one's not tougher than the other, you know, go, go, go to, go try and compete against Alabama and Georgia and Clemson and, and these other guys for, for an athlete and, and, and tell them why you should come to Ohio state, not them. I mean, that, that conversation doesn't change. Um, the authenticity doesn't change. Uh, but I think at the end of the day, it's still the ability to uh, identify the right players, not necessarily the best players. And if you do that, right, we talked about that, that the rest will take care of itself. So um, although a, a lengthy, windy conversation, I don't think the level at play uh, really changes the goal, the goal at hand, the, you know, the goal at hand. So uh, but again, I haven't done it. Never can never assume you can do it. And I never would say that, you know, live in someone's shoes before actually living in their shoes. So but I think philosophically that's the way you'd approach it well i've really enjoyed this i wish we had more time but we don't you got to yeah. get back to work and help the buckeyes yeah yep, we gotta but, go uh, I, yep. I, I, it's been wonderful and uh, and i really enjoyed it and it's easy to see why you're as successful as a coach as you were as a player so well, I appreciate it. And it means a lot more than you think, Bill. Like, and seeing that Lombardi behind you is just wild to me. So it's been an honor. And uh, hopefully this is the last time we Look chat. forward to it. Take care. Awesome. Thanks, Coach.